What you are about to hear might be the most brutal and gruesome case ever. You will hear the horrifying story of a young woman, who was raped, stabbed, nearly decapitated and still managed to fight for her life and overcame her tormentors. The incident in question occurred in December 1994 in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Alison Bother, a 27-year-old woman, was out having fun with her friends. The group spent the afternoon at the beach after traveling there. Afterwards they indulged in ice cream at Allison's place to cap off the practically ideal day. After spending about four years traveling abroad, Allison had settled down to work as an insurance broker and shared a home with her mother and brother. She had agreed to pick up her friend from the party that evening since she didn't want her to walk home alone at night in case something untoward occurred to her. Around 1 a.m. Allison returned from dropping her friend off. Early on Sunday, when she returned, the parking space in front of her house had been stolen. Not a huge deal, just a bit inconvenient. She simply looked about a little to locate a parking space that was close to her home. She only managed to locate one parking space, which was tucked away beneath a large tree that obstructed most of the lighting. After packing up, Allison started to circle back and grab her clean clothes from the passenger seat. But Allison had no idea that someone was lurking in the shadows and monitoring her. Her car door suddenly slid open. Someone had taken advantage of the dimly lighted car area and the lone woman because Allison didn't have a habit of locking her car doors. At one in the morning, the man warned Allison that if she would move, he would murder her. When Allison turned to look at him, she saw that he was actually brandishing a knife. She had no choice but to follow this man's instructions. She moved aside as the stranger entered her vehicle and took the wheel. Then, he started to drive off. Without knowing what lay ahead, Allison could only gaze out the window as he passed her cozy home and continued into the night. After a short while of driving, the man turned to Allison and introduced himself as Clinton. He started to reassure her that he had no desire to hurt her in any way. He only explained that he wanted to use her car for a few hours and that if she consented, everything would be fine and she could go home. He then started to indulge in small talk. Unfortunately, Allison believed the man. Despite that, she thought about getting out of the moving car several times and knocking on someone's door in the hopes that they would let her inside. But she was unable to succeed. She was frozen with terror. Allison started to implore this man. She begged him to simply let her leave and take the car. But he turned it down. He explained to her that he didn't want to use her automobile and that someone had stolen his TV and owed him money. He simply had to act, and he wouldn't be delayed. The man eventually located the person he was seeking for. He told the man to get in after stopping the vehicle. Allison was then introduced as his new acquaintance. Clinton referred to him as Venus. In the rearview mirror, Allison noticed a man who appeared to be purely evil. All three departed in her car. Allison's stomach then sank. She realized that she had been driven to a truly desolate location without any streetlights, a location she had been advised to avoid. Naturally, she realized that things were horrible, but she had hoped that this man would honor his promise. But she realized that she was about to experience something absolutely terrible. I must warn you now that what I'm going to share with you is quite graphic and upsetting. In a rural region, they came to a stop. They then informed Allison that they would be having sex with her whether or not she liked it. Allison was raped by the two men, and one of them started to choke her after that. Allison begged him to spare her life, but he simply ignored her pleas and continued, apologizing only half-heartedly and deceptively. At that point, Allison passed out. After that, they each used a knife to stab Allison 35 times in the abdomen. She started to regain consciousness in the midst of this frenzied state. She was presumed to be dead by the two men, but one of them noticed her leg twitch. Venus grabbed the knife and started hacking at her throat in an effort to cut off her head because he wanted to be sure she was dead. Her head was nearly completely separated from her body and she had about 17 knife wounds in her neck. She watched as the two men sped off, abandoning her there in complete darkness in a remote place with no one in sight to assist her. Allison made it through somehow. As she started to crawl toward the main road, she felt something squishy close to her leg. Her organs were outside of her body because of the numerous stab wounds that had disemboweled her. To prevent her internal organs from spilling out while she crawled, she had to hold her tummy in place with a denim shirt.
The attacks from the knife had, by some miracle or strange glance, missed her vital arteries. She was in such shock that she was unable to feel much pain, but the fact that her windpipe had been severed allowed her to hear her own breathing through a hole one of the stab wounds had left near her collarbone. She claimed to have experienced an out-of-body experience while lying on the ground in the darkness, breathing through one of the stab wounds. She claimed that she had the option of continuing to struggle for survival or giving up and finding peace. But Allison was a fighter and she decided on the latter. Allison had overheard the two men conversing and calling Clinton by his real name. She scribbled their names in the ground just in case she passed away that night, hoping that when her body was discovered, these evil people would be locked up somewhere they couldn't ever hurt anybody else. Venus and Franz were the names she penned. I love you mom, she wrote beneath that. She managed to gather all of her might and stand up as she crawled after realizing she wasn't moving very quickly. However, as she did so, her head dipped backward. Her throat had been chopped so severely that her head was nearly falling off. Allison had to hold her head in position by pulling her head back. With one arm supporting her tummy to prevent her intestines from falling out and the other holding her head in place, she kept walking. She eventually made it to the road, where she was relieved to see a car approaching from a distance. Allison thought she was saved, but when the driver noticed her, he simply sped up and ignored her. At this point, all hope seemed to be lost, but surprisingly, another car passed by, and this time the driver got out. Once they were outside, they were able to contact an ambulance, which arrived after about an hour. Even though it was only a 20-minute drive, she was close to passing away when she arrived at the hospital. The doctors had never seen anything like Allison's injuries. Additionally, a lot of sand and mud had gotten inside of her stomach and all over her intestines because she had crawled with her intestines hanging out. In order to prevent an infection, this needs to be cleansed right away. That evening, she was saved by the emergency services, who started her breathing with a tube. The police sent some photos of local offenders to Allison so she could see whether she recognized any of them. They appeared as they turned the pages. The tube in her neck prevented her from speaking, but she was still able to write down their names. They found and arrested her attackers, whose names and faces she could still clearly recall. The names of the males were seen to be Franz de Toy and Kruger. They had been included in the file for two earlier rapes. Additionally, they were active Satanists who engaged in ritual abuse. However, there was one issue. She needed to publicly accuse these individuals in order to bring a proper case against them to court. She was unable to accomplish it while having a tube down her mouth. So she insisted they take it out against the doctor's orders not to. And she was able to express her accusations against these two terrible attackers in a clear and concise manner. Both of them were given life sentences. After the terrifying attack in August 1995, Allison battled severe depression and found it difficult to find employment. She then started traveling the globe and telling people about her inspiring survivor story. Allison has received numerous honors for her bravery and tenacity, but regrettably the number of stab wounds to her abdomen made it doubtful that she would ever be able to have children. However, Allison was well renowned for defying the odds. She is a mother of two boys at the moment. If you want to learn more about Allison's life, you may purchase her book, I Have Life.